Well, listen, everybody, I just finished speaking a message you're about to watch right now. It's from our headache series right here at Change Church. And the message is called, I Misunderstood the Assignment. There is no such thing as the absence of problems. You'll only experience the exchange of problems. Now you're getting ready to watch this message and I'm gonna ask you to do a couple of things. One, if you're not subscribed to this channel, would you just press that subscribe button? That way every time I place content here, you can be notified about it. The next thing I want you to do is this. If this message really helps you, I'm just gonna ask that you share it with somebody else. That's it. I want you to help me help other people. Enjoy this message. Take care. <laughs> All right, guys, let's go to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 20, beginning at verse number seven. Jeremiah, chapter number 20, beginning at verse number seven. And uh, I'm reading from the New International Version. This is what it says. This is Jeremiah talking. He said, you deceived me, Lord. And I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I want to talk from this subject today. Are y'all ready? Yeah. Here it is. I misunderstood the assignment. <laughs> I misunderstood. Clap your hands if you're ready for God's word, everybody. <laughs> Family in this series called Headaches, we've attempted to articulate a number of truths. In our time together today, I want to regurgitate one that I think is extremely important and yet often overlooked. This principle is going to be captured in this axiom. It is one thing to have a headache because of something we did. It's another thing to have a headache for simply doing something God told you to do. Sim family, I'm simply suggesting that every divine assignment is accompanied by some unique agitation. There is no such thing as a problem free space. Whenever you change spaces, you are simply exchanging one set of problems for another. When you go from single to married, <laughs> you will not experience the absence of problems. You simply exchanged one set of problems for another. When you transition from working for someone else to working for yourself, you will not experience the absence of problems. You simply exchanged one set of problems for the next. Am I making sense? And ladies and gentlemen, it's incredibly important that we wrap our head around this because if not, we will not properly execute and understand divine assignments because we will assume that you can have a calling without a cross. Did you hear what I just said? Here's what the hymnologist said. I'm going to see if I got any old school church girls here. Must Jesus bear? Only about 23 of you know this. The cross alone and all this world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone. One person knows it. And there's a cross for me. 
Jesus put it this way. If any person wants to follow me, come on, let them deny themselves. Is that the book? Take up their cross and follow me. Darius, what, what, what is a cross? The cross is simply a metaphor. Remember, I've taught you this. There are three types of inconveniences in life. Storms, thorns, and crosses. All our trouble fits within one of those three categories. It's a storm, it's a thorn, or it's a cross. A storm is a temporary season of inconvenience intended to be used by the enemy to get us to act impulsively because our impulsive activity in the storm will destroy us when the storm can't. It is a temporary season of inconvenience. Key word is temporary. It came to pass. She got it. It came to pass. I said it came to pass. Some storms you just have to outlast. You've got to make a decision. At some point, one of us is going to quit first. And it's not going to be me. At some point, something's got to shift and something's got to change. And when it shifts and changes, I'll still be standing. Is there anybody that's made a decision? You're going to have a stare down with your storm and let the storm know I've come too far to turn around now. That's a storm. But then there's a thorn. Well, the Apostle Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It says, because of the abundance of revelation that was given unto me, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. He calls this unidentified issue. He says, this is a thorn. This is an instrument of agitation that's sent by the enemy that's intended to cause me to abandon my assignment. Messengers say to buffet me. Buffet means to strike repeatedly. It's not killing me. It's just bothering me. So it's an agitation that the enemy sends because he wants us to abandon the assignment because of the agitation. He wants us to say, I don't have to take this. That's the one. But then there's the cross. which is the inconvenience you choose to endure because you value your calling more than comfort. Yeah. Woo. You can pick up the cross and you can let it down. You're not control, in control of a storm. You're not control, in control of a thorn, but you are in control of the cross. And there is no such thing as a calling without a cross. There's no such thing as a problem-free space. I'm simply exchanging one set of problems for another. Are y'all okay today? Okay, I'm just trying to feel the vibe in the room is just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to catch this and ladies and gentlemen I am saying that there are some assignments that are creating headaches not because of the assignment themselves but because of the way we see it maybe there's nothing wrong with your assignment maybe there's something wrong with the way you see it some misery comes from misunderstanding the assignment. And we have a powerful picture of this in the book of Jeremiah. This gentleman named Jeremiah is introduced to us in an amazingly impactful way. I mean, the tone and the tenor of his calling is one of the most profound in all of scripture. God speaks to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, saying to him, before I form you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Your parents made you, but I form you. They made you. I form you. They conceived you. I crafted you. 
Did you hear what I just said? He said, I crafted you, your strengths and your abilities and your weaknesses and your personality. I designed you for destiny. I wired you for work. I crafted you for a calling. You are not operating with a deficit. You may have some dysfunction, but you don't have a deficit because I put everything in you that needed to be in you to do what I called you to do. It may be in you in latent form and you hadn't tapped into it yet but he's gonna get you to a season of your life where he wakes up the sleeping giant on the inside of you he says to Jeremiah before I formed you in the Muslim I knew you I sanctified you I ordained you as a prophet to the nations Jeremiah said I can't do that I'm but a youth meaning I'm inexperienced and God didn't deny the reality of Jeremiah's inexperience. He just stopped him from speaking those limitations. He say, he didn't say, Jeremiah, you're not young. He just said, don't say it. Did you hear what I just said? He said, don't say it. In other words, don't keep speaking those limitations over your life because you will talk to you more than anyone else. You talk to you more than God talks to you. You talk to you more than friends talk to you. You talk to you more than family talk to you. You talking to you when you don't even realize that you're talking to you. And you got to learn how to talk to you. If you wouldn't let anyone else talk to you that way, don't talk to yourself that way. Oh, we need to practice in here today. I said we need to practice some self-talk. We need to break some self-sabotaging behavior and some destructive habits. Come on, say it with me. I'm healed. I'm blessed. I'm strong. I'm whole. I'm favored. I'm prospering. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above, not beneath. I'm the lender, not the borrower. I'm more than a conqueror if God be for me he's more than the world against me and the devil is defeated somebody give God a praise right there self-talk he said Jeremiah don't don't you are inexperienced but don't keep repeating your limitations because all it is doing is creating and cementing limiting beliefs. It's this amazing thing. He says, I'm going to be with you. You're going to pull down and you're going to root up. It's amazing. Jeremiah said, I'm going to do all of that. He said, yeah. He said, well, sign me up. That's Jeremiah chapter 1. But then we read Jeremiah chapter 20. <laughs> And Jeremiah said, you deceived me. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Did you hear what I just said? He's talking one way in chapter one, but he's talking another way at chapter 20. He's talking one way at the wedding. Yeah. Come, on. Yeah. <laughs> <Are> you... <laughs> come on. Yeah, he's talking one way when he leads that job. I want to know, is there anybody honest enough to admit that you've seen some incongruency and some inconsistency in your communication in chapter one versus your communication in chapter 20? It's like, God, when I said yes in chapter one, I didn't know what was coming in chapter two. You didn't tell me about chapter three and you didn't tell me about by the time I get to chapter 20, I'm like, you deceive me. I had no idea what I was saying yes to. You showed me some parts of my yes, but you didn't show me all of my yes. I want to know, is there anybody honest enough to say, I feel like there are times I was deceived. I, I misunderstood their son. When I was single, I put my juice in the refrigerator and I left and I came back home. My juice was there. My juice was there when I left. My juice was there when I got back. I got married and I had kids and I put my juice in the refrigerator. I go in the other room and I come back. (laughs) 
I was single, my fries is my fries. I get married, I go get some fries. I ask you, do you want some fries before I go get some fries? You're like, no, I don't want some fries. And I come back and I sit in the car and you're like, let me get one fry. I ask you, did you want some fries? We talk one way in chapter one, but another in chapter 20. And Jeremiah is saying, God, I feel deceived. I want, to, I, want you to, I want you to understand contextually what's happened. God shared with Jeremiah, watch this, what he would do. He didn't share with Jeremiah that most of the religious people he was speaking to wouldn't receive it. Because <laughs> it's possible. See, Jeremiah, Jeremiah is listening to God talk about how God anointed him in chapter 1. And he didn't know, I'm, I'm going to be rejected by the very people I'm anointed to help. This is weird. Because God gives Jeremiah prophetic ministry, but then he gives him a unique prophetic message. So Jeremiah's got a choice now whether or not to be faithful to the message that God gave him. And God did not give Jeremiah a wow message. And everybody or many people want to have a wow message. He didn't get a wow message. He got an owl message. The stuff he said didn't make people say, wow. It made people say, ow. There's a whole book called Lamentations where Jeremiah is lamenting. He is called the weeping prophet because many of his messages were messages he had to, to deliver with grief and he had to deliver warnings to Israel regarding their recklessness and he's like God when you gave me the assignment you announced the assignment you didn't reveal the inconvenience you gave me the calling but you didn't give me the cross I didn't know about this part are y'all here? And ladies and gentlemen, it can be that way in ministry, it can be that way in marriage, it can be that way in entrepreneurship, it can be that way with promotions, it can be that way with selling a house, it can be that way with buying a house. There is no such thing as the absence of problems. There's only the exchange of them. And so Jeremiah's delivering, delivering his prophetic message, guys. And I want you to understand what happens to him. He is so hated by one of the temple officials that the temple official takes him to the gate of the city, shackles him publicly, and then flogs him 40 times. This is why Jeremiah said, you deceive me. Because if you would have told me about this in chapter one, I wouldn't have said yes. But because there is no guile in God, God wasn't being deceptive. God was being deliberate. He says, there are times I intentionally withhold information from you until you get to a place and a space that I feel like it's necessary for you to be exposed to that because if Mary you think about how you're going to roll the stone away before you leave the house you never leave Did you hear what I just said? He says, I want you to get sometimes so far in the journey that you have no other choice but to stick with your yes. 
And at this point in the journey, I'm going to use that as a situation for me to give you a revelation, not just of me, but of you. See, God's not just trying to show you him. God's also trying to show you you. And sometimes he's got to put you in a situation where you're shackled and flogged so that you can, yo, so that you can see a version of yourself that you didn't know existed previous to that. Shackled publicly, embarrassed, flogged 40 times. And Jeremiah is saying, if I knew in chapter 1 what was waiting on me in chapters 2 through 19, I wouldn't have done it. But what if I told you? I don't know if y'all ready for what I'm about to say. What if I told you that although Jeremiah didn't get all the information he wanted, he did get more information than he thought he had. And maybe he stopped listening during the parts of the conversation that were more emotionally pleasurable for him. Because when I read Jeremiah 1, when we read Jeremiah 1, we normally stop at verses 5 and 6. Before I formed you in the mother's womb, I knew you. But that's not all God said in chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 17, God says, get yourself ready. Did you hear what I just said? He said, get yourself ready. He says in verse 17, stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them or I will terrify you before them. Today, I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials and the priests and the people of the land. Listen to verse 18, 19. They will fight against you. But, y'all better come get me here. They will fight, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you. So if he promises a rescue, he's asserting that I'm going to need it. And I think sometimes when it comes to the assignment, God isn't as, de- God's not deceptive, but he isn't withholding as much as we articulate. Sometimes we're just not listening. Why does this happen to me? I say it many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. I want you to understand that every calling has a cross. And when you get this revelation, it reduces frustration in your life because frustration comes from failed expectations. When you keep, watch this, failed expectations. So, When you find something you didn't expect, that's frustrating. And when you don't find something you did expect, that's frustrating too. Y'all follow me? So he says, I want you to understand there's no such thing as a calling without a cross. So, I'm teaching this message, which means I'm under a lot of lights. You know what that also means? I'm in a lot of heat. (laughs) You don't get lights without heat. I need more amens in there. I need some fire in the chat. I need (laughs) somebody just put some fire in the chat or something. I said, there is no lights without heat. 
Every calling has a cross. And there are times when God is slow walking us and we're frustrated by his pace, not realizing and recognizing. He says, I'm not, watch this, I'm not limiting your gifts. Your gifts are ready for the calling. I'm trying to get you ready for the cross. Notice the last part of chapter one, God's not talking to Jeremiah about his gifts. He's talking to Jeremiah about his character. He's not talking to Jeremiah about Jeremiah, what Jeremiah can do. He's talking to Jeremiah about who Jeremiah has become. He said, I made you like an iron city. God's like, I'm not holding up what I want to do for you because you can't do it yet. I'm holding up what I'm going to do for you. Until you become an iron city. Because <laughs> this is what comes with that. I want the promotion. Do you want pressure? I don't want anybody else to tell me what to do. I want to tell everybody else what to do. You sure? You ready to do some grown folk babysitting? Y'all not talk. You said it. I need, I need, come on. No, no, no. Yeah, I, 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 no, I, I'm tired of being on a team. I want my own team. You sure? I'm tired of, I'm tired of other people paying me. I, I want to be in a position where I'm paying everybody else. You want that pressure, that payroll on your back? I misunderstood the assignment. There's no such thing as a calling without the cross. No such thing as the absence of problems. There's just the exchange of them. I want to be in more demand. Are you ready to disappoint more people? It can't happen. You cannot have one without the other. If you become in demand in any way and you're committed to sticking to your values and priorities, you're going to have to choose who you disappoint. You cannot be in demand and not disappoint somebody. You're going to disappoint your family. You're going to disappoint your friends. You're going to disappoint those that are calling on you. Because there's no such thing as a calling without a cross. And God's like, sometimes I'm holding you up because these are the only set of problems you can really handle in a healthy way right now. He says, I'm going to raise you up on a level that is consistent with your tolerance for problems. I'm not, I'm not raising you up to a level that's consistent with your anointing. I'm not raising. Oh, my. See, come on. Come on now. Because some of the greatest anointings are in buildings like this. They in storefronts. He says, but I'm not going to raise you up to the level of your anointing. I'm going to raise you up to the level of your tolerance for problems. It's your pain tolerance that determines promotion. The cross hurts. Y'all miss, <laughs> miss what I just said. The cross hurts. God's like, I'm not restricting you. I'm protecting you. And this is, this is what we see happening here with Jeremiah. And this is what's so amazing. It's almost like, almost like what we see in the Psalms, guys. Because uh, in the first part of chapter 20, and I don't even have time to talk about this. Maybe I'll talk about this uh, next month when I start my, well, first Sunday in March when I start my series on prayer. Um, because in the first part of chapter 20, I love it. He's so honest. You got to be bold to tell God, you deceive me. But he's a prophet without pretension. Because the way you talk to God says a lot about what you believe about God. He was a man that obviously believed God could handle my honesty. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? He said, God can handle my honesty. 
He, he was a man that understood that there's no such thing as a repressed or an unexpressed emotion. So if I don't express and articulate this, it's going to show up in unhealthy and in unhelpful ways. So I can control the way I express this or I'm going to get to the point where I can't control the way I express this. And then when God tells me to speak to the rock, I'm going to hit it. Come on now. He tells God, you deceive me. And because he says that in, in the first part of chapter 20, he's able to say this in the latter part of chapter 20, verse 13. Sing to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. He shifts in chapter 7 from saying, you deceive me and woe is me, to chapter 13 saying, give him a praise. Because something happens when you are honest with God. When you hi don't hide, he can heal. When you don't front, he can fix it. When you empty your heart of the wrong thing, he'll fill your heart with the right thing. If you'll go ahead and sow in tears, then you can actually reap in joy. And some people aren't reaping in joy because you won't sow in tears. God's like, I hadn't shifted because you hadn't talked about it. I haven't altered it because you hadn't put it on the altar. So stop acting like you don't want to leave and go on and tell me you want to leave. Let me go to this side over here because I said, I said, so stop acting like you don't want to quit and go ahead and tell me you want to quit. Stop acting like and go on and tell me I'm weak and I feel like I'm at my wit's end and if something doesn't happen, I don't know what I'm going to do. Go ahead and talk to me about it so I can do something about it. Hey, boy, I wish we wasn't in a pandemic. But don't touch anybody, but just point across the room and say, he's getting ready to do something. Yeah, he's getting ready to do something. He's getting ready to do something because if you'll get real, he'll make it right. I said, if you get real, he'll make it right. Verse 7 and verse 13, completely different. Because he's honest. And I don't know about you. I want to know how he got from verse 7 to verse 13. Did you hear what I just said? I, I want to know how he got from verse 7 to verse 13. Because that helps me handle the cross better that comes with my calling. There is no such thing as cross-free living. There's no such thing by, as being used by God and not being used by people. See, y'all, let me come back over here. Let me. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. Yes, I am. There is no such thing as being used by God and not being used by people. Some of us trying to avoid it. You can't. That's not life. So maybe because that's life, that's not the problem. Maybe the problem is the way I'm thinking about my assignment. People will use, they're going to use you and leave you. Not all, some. Some people are going to love you as long as the answer is yes. They're going to love you up to your no. That's life. And the difference between those that faithfully carry out their assignment and those that don't carry out their assignment is that those that faithfully carry out their assignment learn to live with it. And those that don't live complaining about it. I didn't hear Jesus complain one time about Judas. Not one complaint. And he's perfect. So it means he would manage that relationship perfectly. 
Jesus is perfect. He managed the relationship perfectly. He said everything perfectly. He did everything perfectly. He was there all the time, and Judah still betrayed him. Now, if that happened to Jesus, and you're not Jesus, what makes you think that's never going to happen to you? I was a good husband. How did he do that? I was a good wife. How did he? How did he? Jesus was perfect and was still betrayed. Because there's no such thing as a cross-free life. It's no such thing as a business without hiccups. It's no such thing as perfect children. It's no such thing as a perfect marriage. Come here. It's no such thing as a perfect ministry. Dream team, not perfect. Never going to be perfect. All of them are never going to do all of what you say to do. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Except that. So maybe the problem isn't the assignment. Maybe it's not ministry. Maybe it's not entrepreneurship. Maybe it's not the marriage. Maybe it's not parenting. Maybe I'm misunderstanding the assignment. So how do I get from verse 7 to verse 13? How do I get from frustrated and wanting to quit to verse 13 where I'm saying, but God's good? I believe there's some things that happened that made Jeremiah shift. I want to share them with you. Can I share these with you? It's just three of them. Can I give them to you really quickly? Because this is what I believe. I believe Jeremiah got some revelation that caused a revolution in the way he was looking at his assignment. And I want to share this with you. I want to capture this revelation in phrases. So here's the first statement. If you're ready, say yes. When I'm obedient to God, God becomes responsible for me. My obedience makes him responsible. When I obey him, it's his responsibility to protect me. Did you hear what I just said? Because sometimes, like, I could have I preached this with Jonah, because sometimes it feels like obeying him puts me in jeopardy. God told Jonah, go to Nineveh, and, God, and Jonah's like, I don't want to go to Nineveh because they kill people like me. <laughs> See, sometimes I think we, don't, we sanctify Jonah's story. He ran for a reason. He's like, I want to live. <laughs> but self-protection is an illusion. I'm going to say it again. Self-protection is an illusion. You feel like you're protecting you, but you can't. You can, we leave here. You can control what side of the road you drive on going home. That's the only thing you can control. You cannot control who's on the road right now that was drinking. You can't control a malfunction with your brakes. You can't control whether black ice is on the road and you don't see it. Self-protection is an illusion. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if any of y'all can relate to this, but if you've ever had, maybe it happens with little girls too, I don't have one. But when my boys were growing up, they would always, from time to time, think they were helping me lift something, they wouldn't lift it. <laughs> Listen, they straining. Because they're giving it all that they got. Not realizing that all that they got ain't enough. The only... <sighs> Not realizing I'm carrying all of the weight. And God wants you to know ah, with all the straining you've been doing and all the strategizing you've been doing, it hadn't been enough. You hadn't been protecting you. I was protecting you. I was the one that was covering you. I was the one that was keeping you. I was the one that made them be quiet because I said, if your ways please me, I'll make your enemies be at peace with you. I'll make people that could talk be quiet. Y'all, where am I real? See, y'all not ready? To... Yes, y'all, I'm coming right back. He said, I'll make people that could talk be quiet. When I'm obedient to God, I become his responsibility. 
because I'm really not protecting me. You are. Okay, y'all ready for number two? Here it is. The pain I have is less than the pain I missed. (laughs) Whatever pain you got is less than the pain you missed. Come here, Job. Whatever got through the hedge is less than what I kept outside the hedge. God's like, oh, so you think if you would have avoided this assignment, you would have avoided pain. Oh, oh, you think if you didn't do what I said, life would have been easier. God's like, not only, watch this. This is so powerful. God's like, you see, not only would there still be pain, but there will be pain without my presence. See, Jeremiah 20 verse 11 says, but the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. He with me. Come on. He's with me. He says, I do not change my plan just because you change your mind. Where am I? I'm where you supposed to be. If you looking for me, that's where I am. If I told you to go to Cherith, that's where I am. If I told you to go to Zarephath, that's where I am. I am not going to change my plan just because you change your mind. The pain I have is less than the pain I miss. Practically, I could talk about everything that could have happened in my life if I went to law school. But this leads me to number three. Y'all, y'all not ready for this one. I don't believe you're ready. You ready? Here's number three. My options are an illusion. God's like, oh, you thought you had a choice. (laughs) Oh, you thought you could have really went to law school. Oh, you you thought that would have worked out if you disobeyed me? Don't you know I'm the rainmaker? That you can sow the seed, you can till the ground, you can do all the work, but there's no fruit from your labor unless I make it rain. Y'all, you better, did you hear what? I got to make it rain. You can go to law school all you want. I got to make it rain. You can study all you want. I got to make it rain. You got, you can interview as best as you want. I got to make it rain. You can study all night for the LSAT. I got to make it rain. You can start the business. I have to make it rain. You can market the company. I got to make it rain. You can buy social media ads. I got to make it rain. I'm the rain maker. Somebody throw your hands in the air and say, Lord, make it rain. Hallelujah. Make it rain. Make it rain on my marriage. Make it rain on my mind. Make it rain on my ministry. Make it rain on my money. Make it rain. He said, your options are an illusion. I'm done. Jeremiah said, I will not make mention of his word. Verse 9. I will not speak more anymore in his name. But his word is within me like a burning fire shut up in my bones. God's like, yeah, you could have went to law school, but you've been back. <laughs> y'all, y'all not... <laughs> You've been back. Yeah, Jonah, you can get on the ship. Going toward Tarsus. You'll be back. You're going to be back wetter, dirtier, tired, having wasted time. The three days you was in the well, Jonah, you could have did the work and been back home. (laughs) 
Did you hear what I just said? <laughs> he said, those three days you could have done the work and been back home. He said, because when my hand is on you, your options are an illusion. And sometimes we're observing the activity of other individuals saying they get to do what they can do. And God's like, they not you. Many are called. Few are chosen. And for some of us, he say, no, I picked you. And your options are an illusion. Watch this. And whatever I assign you to is not what's best for me. It's what's best for you. God's like, now you do know I have options. Jeremiah, you do know I can go down a list until I find another yes. This isn't just what's best for me, Jeremiah. This is what's best for you. Because you were born for this. And I'm talking to some people today who, if you're honest, I want us to be honest with God. Who, if you're honest, you'll admit, Pastor Darius, I'm dealing with a little agitation. I got faith, but I'm still a little frustrated. Because I started out in chapter 1, but right now I think I'm kind of in chapter 20. But may the Holy Spirit release you today. Listen to me. Because if you will release your assumptions about what it's supposed to be like, God will show you what it can be like. He's like, if you will release the need to have that to be happy, I'll show you how to be happy with what you have. He's saying, don't attach your happiness to that. Attach your happiness to me. Let me show you how to be happy with what my life and your life is not your own. I want to pray for some people who are dealing with some agitation. <clears throat> like I'm a little frustrated, Pastor. It's not going the way I thought it would go. And God knows my heart. Pastor, I don't know how well I'm handling it. I'm praying about it but I honestly don't know if I'm okay. Pastor, the relationship didn't work out. I really wanted it to. And as much as I tell myself it wasn't good for me, I'm, st I'm still struggling a little bit. Pastor, I stepped out in this business venture and I thought, I thought things were going to accelerate a lot quicker than they actually are. Pastor, I just had a birthday recently, and uh, I should have been grateful to God that I had another year of life. But all I can think about is I should be further along than I am right now. I'm frustrated. But if you will release your assumptions of what it's supposed to be like, God will show you what it can be like. I want to pray that God supernaturally will open your eyes and help you address this agitation. Father, I thank you right now for every single, oh glory, every single person. I thank you now for them. That's wrestling with frustration. And in the privacy of our hearts, we say to you what Jeremiah said. We, we say what we feel. We feel frustrated. We feel disappointed. We feel angry. We feel deceived. We feel
feel discouraged, we give it to you. Because if we will talk to you about it, you can do something about it. Father, break the yoke of discontentment. For your word says godliness with contentment is great gain. Break the yoke of discontentment. And help us accurately understand the assignment. I pray this over your life. In Jesus' name. Lift your hands. I want to be trapped.